Hello. I'm Mr. Red. A horse is a horse, of course, of course, and no one can talk to a horse, of course, that is, of course, unless the horse is the famous Mr. Red. Go right to the source and ask the horse, he'll give you the answer that you endorse. He's always on a steady course. Talk to Mr. Red. Hey, everybody, don't change your computer. You're in the right place. So no one can talk to a horse? That's not true. In fact, people talk to horses all day long. It doesn't get weird until the horse starts talking back. In fact, that's what makes today's crazy story so crazy. No, we're not talking about Mr. Ed, but rather another talking equine. Uh, Balaam's donkey. Maybe you've heard this story about how God uses a talking donkey in a very powerful way. That's what we're going to talk about today. It's not crazy for somebody to talk to a donkey. It only becomes a crazy story when the donkey talks back. And so let's explore today's crazy story from Numbers chapter 22. And I'll encourage you to read. We're not going to get through the whole story because of time limitations today, but I'll encourage you to read the full story in chapters 22 and 23. But let me start in Numbers 22, starting in verse 1. It says, Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. There were so many Israelites. Moab is a region. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread. All of these people were fearful because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, This horde is going to lick up everything around us like an ox licks up the grass of the field. They're just going to wipe us out. So let me set the context for us a little bit here. Israel is about four months from the end of their 40-year wilderness wandering. They've been walking and wandering for a long time, and now uh, the generation of Israelites that are going to enter in the Promised Land are almost there. They're, They're four months away. And their victories are mounting as they're going through and uh, going to battle with people, tribes and people groups who are in the promised land, who are opposing them and opposing God. Uh, Their victories are mounting and it's causing great fear among (laughs) their potential enemies uh, and adversaries. And so uh, we, we see that fear here in this story. So Balak, the son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor. Okay, let me uh, take a minute here and introduce you to the main characters in our story. Balak is the king of Moab. His people are terrified because Israel is approaching, the nation of Israel, the, the, the the people are approaching and they're expecting a imminent attack. And they've heard how much success the Israelites have had in their conquest and in their battles. And so uh, Balak sends a group of people to hire, basically employ, a Moabite prophet named Balaam. Um, He's known as having a divine connection to God. And as we read, uh, listen to, to Balak's message to Balaam. A people has come out of Egypt, the Israelites. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. They're encamped close to Moab, which is what is causing so much fear. Now come, Balak is inviting or asking Balaam to come, come and put a curse on these people people, because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed, and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them a fee for divination, for divine activity, an amount of money to hire Balaam for his divine activity. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. So obviously, just to make sure we're, we're, we're tracking along here, uh, the people of Moab want to hire Balaam, right, to uh, help them defeat the Israelites. Uh, 
Now remember, in the context of the ancient Near East, there's a, there's a lot of warfare. There's a lot of fighting for lands and conquest. And there's a lot of belief in spiritual intervention in that warfare. In fact, a common belief in the ancient Near East, there are, there are many gods, there are many theology, there are many beliefs about how the world works and how uh, life works. Um, but one of the prominent and commonly held beliefs among all people groups and all different tribes is that when two people groups went to war, it wasn't just the people groups that were fighting each other. It was their gods, whatever gods they believed in, lowercase g, gods, whatever god or gods they believed in were going to war. And the common belief was that whoever, whichever tribe had the stronger God would win the battle. And that's why the Moabites here are reaching out to Balaam to come and get his uh, intervention, his spiritual intervention into this expected battle that they're anticipating is going to happen with the Israelites. And so they are trying to hire Balaam for divine intervention to protect them uh, against the Israelites, to put a curse on the Israelites so they will have victory in battle. Verse 8. Uh, Balaam says to this uh, contingency that comes to hire him in verse 8, Spend the night here, he says to them, and I will report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite officials stayed with him. So he's going to go confer with the Lord. Should I go and put a curse on this group of people that is attacking Moab? God came to Balaam and asked, why, who are those men with you? This is one of those situations where um, we know God is omniscient and we know God knows all of these things. But for whatever reason, God asks these questions uh, and, and, and kind of puts out there uh, this truth. The, the, they're, they're boundary setting questions. It's not as if God doesn't know the answer. Um, Balaam says to God, Balak, son of Zippor and king of Moab, has sent this message to me. A people that's come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them. Perhaps I will be able to fight them and drive them away. So Balaam is explaining to God, you know, the, the offer, the proposal that has been given to him. But verse 12, but God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. Now, I want to put a little, little pause here and notice something. Balaam himself is a pretty unexpected source of insight. Balaam is not an Israelite. And yet we see very clearly in this instance, he has a, a very strong connection and communion with God. He is getting a, a very clear um, connection to the Lord. And it's important for us to note that while Israel was known as um, the Lord's chosen nation, his chosen people, the ones who were supposed to be his instrument and tool in the world, God was available to all people and all creation, those who sought him and those who came to know him as the true God of all creation. And so uh, a fascinating and important Old Testament detail here for us to uh, see and understand. So moving on to verse 13, and I know there's a lot of text in, in this today. It says, the next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, go back to your own country for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite officials returned to Balak and said, Balaam has refused to come with us. He's not going to come. You would think that might be the end of it, but of course it's not. Then in verse 15, then Balak sent, the other sent other officials, more numerous, more officials, and more distinguished, more impressive than the first. They came to Balaam and said, this is what Balak, son of Zippor, says, do not let anything keep you from coming to me, because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and per put a curse on these people for me. So obviously we, we know what's happening here. We've got some negotiations that are going on. Uh, Balaam refuses Balak's first offer. So Balak does what most people would do. He says, well, let me up the offer, right? That's, that's basically what he's doing here. He's gi giving Balaam a blank check. He says, do not let anything keep you from coming to me. I will reward you handsomely. Do whatever you say. He's giving a blank check. Whatever it costs 
whatever it takes for you to come and intervene and protect us, you come and, and we will reward you handsomely. We will take care of you very well. And so that's what's happening here, some negotiations. But verse 18 says, But Balaam, Balaam answered to them, Even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now spend the night with here, uh, here, so that I may I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. Um, here we see some very clear faithfulness from Balaam, and 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 note this because this is important and it's going to come into play. Uh, basically, he's telling Balak with this blank check offer. He says, "Look." whatever you offer me, it doesn't matter. The, the Lord is in control. I can't do anything against the strength of the God of Israel. It doesn't matter what you offer. Now, this is where things get really interesting. Verse 20. That night God said to Balaam, or came to Balaam and said, Since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read verse 20, it seems to me like Balaam has a green light to go ahead and go uh, with these representatives of Moabite, uh, of Moab uh, to go and be with them and to offer his services. Uh, God certainly appears to give Balaam permission. He says here, go with them, but do only what I tell you. We're going to get into this in a minute. Verse 21. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the Moabite officials. Doesn't sound like he's done anything wrong. But then comes verse 22. But God was very angry when Balaam went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. So what happens here? Does God change his mind? You know, to be honest with you, I don't... I didn't really know the answer. This is one of those, you know, why are we doing these crazy stories? Because these are the stories that cause us to scratch our head and wonder what's going on here. Well, this is my head scratcher moment. Why is God angry? Didn't he just tell him the night before, go ahead and go with these officials, go back to Moab, go to Balak, it, it's okay? Well, this is where I needed to dig in a little bit and do a little research into the, the Hebrew and the original language here. Um, and, and as we look at this text, um, in particular, what is translated here, I'm, I'm reading from the NIV, and so if you have a different translation of the English Bible, it might express this a little differently. But where it's translated in the NIV, Balaam got up in the morning. There are different ways to express this in English, and uh, perhaps if you join us in small group, we'll want to hear a little bit about how it's expressed in your translation of the Bible. Uh, but there's different ways to express this in English. Um, but the Hebrew, ki hohalach hu, um, really indicates the tense is that he's moving in his own strength. Um, and, and, and it could be translated within his own head. Uh, Balak got up in the morning. He, he made the determination um, that this is how he was going to go forward. And, and so understand, God's instructions were very clearly, you can go with them, but what? Key detail, do only what I tell you to do. Okay, So while he got the big picture green light, you can go with these men, he got the very important detail, but do only, as you go with them, do only what I tell you to do. And so we note that God did not say, um, yes, you can get up, you can saddle your donkey, donkey, you can leave in the morning, you can... So notice an important distinction here as we're following the guidance of the Lord. There's a distinction between a big picture and a detail, right? Big picture, you have my permission to go with them. Detail, but only do what I tell you to do as you're going with them. And so Balaam's issue here is he acted under the authority of the big picture, right? You can go with them, but he didn't uh, obey the details. He didn't surrender the details of how he went with them to the Lord's authority. And I know that we're, we're getting into semantics and it's getting a little muddy here, but it's a key theological point that I want to touch on as we wrap this up. And basically it reminds us that following the Lord, faithfully following the Lord, is a step-by-step -step process. 
It takes patience. It takes diligence. It takes daily connection. In, in fact, we're not too far removed from our Sunday morning message on when you don't know what the Lord is doing or when you can't see far, just take one faithful step at a time. Such a key theological insight, especially seen in the Old Testament. So the Lord does not want Balaam to go. And look what happens here in verse 22. Balaam was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, it turned off the road and into a field. Balaam beat it to get it back on the road. He whipped the donkey to get it going the right direction. Um, and, and again, interesting details here. Balaam is a, a hired gun. He's known as a spiritual guru. That's why they have come to see him and to hire him. And yet in this moment, in this instant, he doesn't have the spiritual insight of his donkey. Another key little insight and detail. And a reminder that God uses all people and all beings, unexpected sources to, uh, to bring about spiritual insight and revelation and bring about guidance. The angel of the Lord, verse 24, the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path through the vineyard with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against the wall. So Balaam beat the donkey again. Then the angel of the Lord moved on ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, it laid down under this laid down on the ground, and Balaam was angry and beat it with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and it said to Balaam, What have I done to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You've made a fool out of me. Obviously, all of the officials of Moab are here and can see that, you know, this guy we've come to hire, this impressive guy, can't even ride a donkey. He can't even get his donkey to mind him. So he's upset. He says, you've made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. Now, here's a crazy idea uh, or, or detail here. I don't know about you, but if I'm ever riding a horse or a donkey and it stops and talks to me, I don't think my first reaction is going to be respond. I'm probably running for the hills. It's 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 kind of comical to me that Balaam stops and responds to the donkey's statement. Why are you beating me? And and they have a conversation here. Um, and the donkey said to Balaam, am, am, "Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you?" Basically saying, "Hey." Don't you realize that I'm a, a faithful, I'm a good donkey, I'm obedient. I do what you tell me to do. There's a reason that I'm stopping. Um, then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So Balaam bowed down and fell face down. The angel of the Lord said to him, why have you beaten this donkey these three times? I've come here to oppose you because your path is a reckless one before me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If it had not turned away, I would certainly have killed you by now. But I, uh, but I have spared you because of the donkey. Basically, the donkey has saved Balaam's life from the angel of the Lord. Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, I have sinned. I did not realize you were standing in the road to oppose me. Now, if you are displeased, I will go back. The angel of the Lord said to Balaam, go with these men, but speak only what I tell you. So Balaam did indeed end up going with Balak's officials, but it is reiterated here by the angel of the Lord, speak only what I tell you. Do only the step-by-step -step instructions. It's not enough to have the big picture green light. You need to follow the step-by-step -step instructions. Now here's the principles, and I do want to wrap this up here. I'm mindful of the time. Here's the spiritual principles that I want to highlight. Following the Lord is a step-by-step -step process, as we just discussed and talked about. It's not enough just to get the big idea, green light from God, and then take off running in our own strength, in our own plans, in our own agendas, in our own ideas. You know, this takes daily patience, daily guidance, daily prayer, and daily meditation to get step-by-step -step guidance and instructions from the Lord. You know... 
we, we saw clearly Balaam had the, the big picture green light. Go with these men. The problem is he started to fill in the details about how and when, where he would go, what he would say, what he would do in his own strength. He ignored the details. And so the reminder for us is, you know, so often we get a big picture sense of what is the next chapter in our life. You know, maybe we feel like the Lord is, is calling me to get married or the Lord is calling me to be a chiropractor or to graduate school or to med school or to uh, this college or that college or uh, the Lord is calling me to end this friendship or have this conversation or, or whatever it is. We get that big picture understanding of what's next and then we take the details of how to execute that big picture into our own strength, our own understanding. And it's a reminder. This story is a reminder to us. It's not enough to just get the big picture. We need daily step by step. If we want to execute the big picture uh, um, tasks or, or callings of the Lord in our life, Properly, we need daily directives, daily steps on how to follow the Lord. What is the next faithful step? And as I'm sitting here in the conference room at Southminster and looking out the windows in front of me at this you know, facility expansion project we're doing, I'm, I'm reminded of this. You know, years ago, we got a big picture idea that in order to bless the current and future ministry of Southminster Church, we needed to, to make some facility changes. And uh, we, we, we prayed and thought and had a lot of conversations about that. And it has taken a long time, right? It's taken a long time to, to get to where we are. And it's so exciting to see the progress that's being made. But it's taken us a long time and a lot of diligence to get here. And I remember us thinking, you know, one of the faithful things we need to do is have a worship space that is sufficient to house all of our current members and our anticipated future guests. We, we want to make sure that when people came, they had a place to join us, a place to sit. There was enough room for everybody. And so we went out, we had that big picture green light. We had conviction and confirmation that this is what the Lord is doing next. Not too long after that, we had a plan. But I'll tell you what, the plan that we came up with initially is much different than the plan we had now. And along the way, while we had a, a big picture green light, along the way there were a lot of details to be worked out. Probably you've heard the statement, haste makes waste. And, and we understand that. When we make hasty decisions, it often leads us in the wrong directions. And, and this is a challenge for us. And, 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 you know, I use this as an example, but, but the examples of this in our, in our daily lives is just as important. This is a challenge for us to wait on the Lord. How many times do we see that statement in Scripture? Wait on the Lord. Trust the Lord. Let the Lord go before you, right? We like to go before the Lord. We like to get a green light and take off running. And I think it's especially challenging in our modern world where we are so accustomed to instant results and instant answers. We can get on our computer, we can Google something, we can say, hey, Alexa, what's the weather outside? Uh, you know, we, we have you know, <laughs> devices that can give us information and responses in a matter of seconds. And think about when our, our Wi-Fi or something is lagging and it's moving slow. Think about how frustrated we get that those responses, that feedback is not coming instantly. And look, as we look at scripture, we need to understand walking with the Lord, executing the Lord's big picture plans in our life is not an instantaneous response. It is a daily practice of walking with the Lord and walking in his wisdom. Now, the next thing that we see here is that God uses unexpected sources for insight. And we see that in, in Balaam himself, right? He's a Moabite prophet. He is not somebody that we would look at and expect, you know, he's got incredible insight and connection to the Lord. But to take it a step further, not only is Balaam himself an unexpected source for insight, but certainly his donkey is an unexpected source for spiritual insight, and so here's the lessons that we can learn in this. We will miss the Lord's guidance if we are closed off to others, right? Uh, Balaam could have dismissed his donkey and it would have been to his downfall. Downfall. Jesus was widely dismissed as the Messiah by uh, the majority of people because he didn't look, he didn't act, he didn't smell Right? Like the Messiah, Jesus was was basically a wandering, itinerant speaker 
um, n not the kind of royal, majestic, a person of power and influence that that people would think, well, this is a, a divine source of inspiration. And so he was widely dismissed because of his appearance and because of his status and because of his position. In fact, if we look at all of the disciples and all of their stories, none of them are individuals that we would tend to think of as spiritual leaders. In fact, the Apostle Paul is probably the only person of, of significant education and prominent position that is in a, new, in a leadership position in all of the New Testament. And so the reality is we are reminded here that we will miss out if we are closed to spiritual insight because it comes from an unexpected source. And so it causes us to ask ourselves, have we dismissed spiritual maturity and spiritual wisdom in somebody because of their position in life, because of their social status, because of our own you know, uh, assumptions about who they are and what they could possibly know and what kind of position. They don't have the right pedigree. They don't have the right training. They don't have the right position. They don't have the right... You know, have we dismissed somebody's spiritual wisdom and insight because we've put worldly parameters on who uh, can be a, a, a person of inspiration and guidance? And so this not only shapes our interaction, but it shapes our theology of ministry, right? Many people, many Christian leaders uh, seem to think these along these same lines that, you know, because someone has the right education, and I'm not dismissing education, it is so important for us to be able to interpret and understand scripture rightly. But along with that, God gives unique wisdom to people of all positions. And so we need to be mindful that a ministry leader is not somebody of authority who sits around and tells everybody else what to do, but somebody who works with the spiritual wisdom and insight and inspiration within the flock to move the whole group together. This is, this is a very important insight for us as followers of Christ. Um, so we uh, miss out when we dismiss others' uh, potential for spiritual insight. And the other reality, the flip side of this, is others miss out when we dismiss our, ourselves as potential sources of insight. You know, this is the other trap that I, I see people fall into. We feel conviction. We feel guidance from the Lord. We feel uh, inspiration. And we think, well, who am I? You know, who am I to, to share that or understand? Or, or God couldn't use me. You know, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy very clearly, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. Uh, because you you haven't finished your training yet, because you uh, you know for f don't have as much experience. Don't let anybody look down on that. The Lord is using you in a powerful way. One of the most significant expressions in the New Testament is when Jesus breathed his last. The temple curtain tore in two. That was a clear declaration that God uses all people. All people are invited to the Holy of Holies. We no longer need the um, priest to go between God and humanity, the intermediary anymore. We don't need that. We are welcome to come to the Lord and to uh, be in communion with the Lord in connection with the Lord. Now, there's a caveat to that. And it kind of goes along with the first point. You know, we're not to move in our own strength. <laughs> the, 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 temple curtain tearing and the invitation to the coming in the holies of holies is an invitation to be in communion and connection with the Lord. And so while God can use anyone for spiritual insight and inspiration, it is imperative that those people who God is using, if they want to be faithful expressions of what the Lord is doing, are in daily communion, that they are in the Holy of Holies, that they are in the presence of the Lord, that they are making sure the spiritual inspiration that they are espousing to the world is accurate and faithful. So there's a lot of things uh, happening in this passage. I'm trying to be very mindful of the time. I know we're running longer than we wanted these to go, but I hope you'll take some time to read this. Read the rest of the story in Numbers 22 and 23 and join one of our online or on-campus groups to discuss this crazy story about a, talking don about a talking donkey. Hey, brothers and sisters, have a blessed day. I hope this blesses you and I hope it inspires you. And I hope you'll join us as we continue our discussion of these important insights in this crazy story. Take care.